obviously, uh, Heidi's already been up and, and attended as well, so maybe, Bill, you'd like to quickly introduce yourself and what sure. it is you do. Um, so my name is Bill Mooney. I'm Chief Product Officer at Skills. Uh, I'm a long-time industry veteran. I just came from uh, an interesting year at EA where I made Galaxy Heroes. Um, wow. It's a game that uh, has been interesting. Um, and uh, I left it to go to Skills because I was interested in um, fundamentally different player motivation. Which yeah. is skills sort of approaching esports with a very different dimension. Sort of Vainglory sort of trying to essentially be sort of the elite full thing. We're really trying to sort of take that core player motivation of being interested and sort of coming at it from a participation standpoint. Yeah. And so I'm there and involved, um, and um, it's a business where I fundamentally believe that esports, which is one of this panel, um, is actually a much bigger opportunity than people probably see it as. Already. Okay, cool. That's, that's going to segue nicely into my first question. So at the moment, there, there are various kind of things that would be the next big thing. I know VR is the, the, the most over <laughs> um, and, and esports is another one which is everyone's going on. In, in mobile, especially, it's all about esports. That's how you know that's what you've got to be into. Um, it, it's looking at the, 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 the kind of the market sort of uh, size in terms of the kind of value at the moment. It's, it's I always think it's lower than I expect it to be. Assuming the engagement numbers are kind of huge. So you know, is it? You're going to say yes, but you have, I have to ask yeah, the question. Sure. So is it is it is the, is the kind of hype justified, and, and, and how big how big I guess can, can esports get in the next couple of years? Well, one quick note um, on why I actually don't like VR, although I love my Vive, um, is because fundamentally not enough people have it in their hands. Um, yeah. The thing that uh, about esports um, and the thing that skills because it's sort of more the platform play. Um, I was in traditional games, console, etc., and then I went to Zynga very early when we were at 30 people. Oh, wow. And uh, that was great. Um, you are okay. were at 30 people. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. And I had Farmville and Mafia Wars um, at their biggest, and Zynga Poker. And the thing that, the pattern recognition I have for <coughs> esports as a whole is that what happened with Facebook is that it was distribution to people who thought they weren't gamers. And it yeah. doesn't seem like this. A lot of people here, I'm sure, hate social games and hate Facebook games. But in fact, the core player motivations were actually profound deep gamer plays. I mean, many of the best games were made by a bunch of RTS people. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, Machine Zone, those guys were social game makers. That whole trend arose directly out of Kings of Camelot, which started with Facebook, etc. So what was interesting about that, it was, I think fundamentally Facebook was about a distribution play and about sort of social possibility. And esports, to me, is actually tapping the, the sort of the sports part of it, which is good competition, yeah. right? And the fact is, um, one of the negatives, in my opinion, about the <coughs> Um, thing for accepted and some other stuff accepted is that it has minimized the disadvantage of pay to play is it tends to make it very disadvantaged for multiplayer. Yeah. And I think stuff like League of Legends, I'm sure you guys spend tons of time on this, uh, Bang Boy, all the sort of the prominent esports games is it's about fairness. And yeah. people want that narrative of watching people compete fairly. Yeah. And I think from my perspective, um, I mean Facebook games were extremely frankly disdained when I joined and they I think never really were embraced by yeah. sort of the broader game community. Whereas esports, I think there's that hardcore because everybody who works in the industry is much more likely to that kind of see that kind of thing. But it's much broader because that core motivation exists, and then there are two billion phones out there, and okay. people like to compete. Okay, so you're you're, you're relatively upbeat. So how how big is it going to get? I mean, like the mobile industry right now is worth like 35 billion dollars. Is there all numbers in the end? So, so I think, you know, is it going to be like 10 percent of that? Is it going to be? I think it it'll be a third. Would yeah. be my own guess. And the reason I say that is. Um, uh, the way it works for monetization is that your most hardcore people are disproportionately a part of the revenue. They're disproportionately a part of the hours. I'm sure the uh, gentleman Ryan from Twitch would say the same thing. It is your passion of people who spend yeah. the most, who play the most, who put in the most hours. I'm sure for Vainglory, your top 10% or 50% of your plays, 70% of your money, you know, whatever the percentage would be. So I think it'll actually be much more money. money. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to say a word yet. Yeah, exactly. But the point being that um, I think that there's a much bigger audience for it, yeah. and it will be worth a lot. And the thing is, there are two billion phones. I mean, I think something like 80% of everybody has at least a game on their phone. I don't yeah, yeah. Well, that's, that's, that's too big. Smart right. I think is actually the, the, the bigger. Uh, the, the, the right. phones is bigger. Than yeah, smart two billion smartphones. I'm sorry, I don't even care. No, about no, that. no. Well, well, yeah, you can still do something. Unless you're WhatsApp. You know. Yeah, yeah, fair. Oh, and, and so, that's, so Ted, well, you know, obviously you did some stats, so I missed a bit of it because I had to run back. But so, to, do you agree with that kind of? Estimation, you were looking at the size of the market, you're obviously looking at the space itself. Do you, do you think that it's going to be how, how big it could get? Oh, definitely. Um, and like I said, I alluded to a little bit of that in my um, presentation, but yeah, obviously, I'm a little bit biased. I mean, we're all in the space, and you know, the reason why, uh, from a developer's standpoint, from a platform standpoint, from a content standpoint, yeah, we're in the space because we really believe that it has the potential to grow. Uh, and in terms of our audience size, um, 
I think the easy way, and you know, uh, Christian for me, where obviously, and I, you makes mention to this in a lot of articles about the number of devices that are out there, but um, I, I think as well, it, it's because right now the space is so new, uh, and yeah, it's, it's unlike esports, when esports was started, um, uh, I said this in my presentation as well, it really started with the Korean movement of StarCraft. I mean, never, no one really thought of uh, you know, competitive video games until you know, some people really took it seriously and took, took it to the next level and people thought, hey, this is kind of fun to watch. Um, but you know, esports has been building up for the past 10, 10 plus years already. And I think yeah. it's an easy transition to mobile because people can already see what's happened with the League of Legends scene, what's yeah. happened with the CSGO scene. So no, I think the potential is definitely huge. It's huge. So we're looking, a guess to make around about 10, 10 to $11 billion dollars in the next couple of years, probably, probably next year. Yes. Um, so I'm looking at the, 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 the kind of makeup of that, that, what that, that could be like. I mean, right now, obviously, uh, MOBA, um, it's Vainglory's MOBA, it's, it's, it's uh, a kind of made for mobile version of what's already out there. It's, it's, it's brought some new innovations and stuff, but it is, it is using something that's already out there. Um, and it's quite deep and, and hardcore involved. I, I, I played it and I'm, I'm not very good at it because I, I just I think I'm too old and slow. In, on the other side, you've got experiences uh, like you know the, the Supercell's kind of Clash Royale, which is much lighter. It's a three-minute game. Anybody can pick up and play. They might be very good at it. But do you think that, that esports in PC, it feels to me esports is very much the real super hardcore, um, more you know involved games, teenage teenage players, whereas do you think mobile esports can be more broad? You know, is, is, will there be this kind of spectrum where you've got the kind of Clash Royale light, lighter, at least entry point, up into the more involved mobas? Um, if you're directing the question to me, I think abso Anybody, absolutely, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely yes. Um, I mean, to kind of add to those numbers a little bit, if you look at esports, there's around 700 to 800 million PCs around the world. Yeah. And esports is a big thing. If you look at smartphones, I think that the number is 3 billion smartphones out there. So if you look at the potential reach of esports, the numbers are just humongous, right? So, so both mobile esports has the potential to become a mass market thing. And th if the bigger the thing becomes, obviously you'll have a broader selection as well. Yeah. And much like in PC, like I mentioned earlier, it's, it's not only League of Legends and Dota 2. You have Hearthstone competitions, you have CSGO, you have um, Rocket League. You have a ton actually happening in esports, and I do find that in mobile esports, there's going to be similarly um, a lot of space for, for multiple titles. Maybe people want to watch competitive Candy Crush. I don't know. That could that could be a thing. I mean, if you look at mobile gamers overall, it's, it's such a broad piece. I think yeah. the kind of the definition of gamer overall has changed largely due to mobile because we all suddenly play games, not only just you know hardcore <laughs> yeah. hardcore gamer folks. So I definitely do think that esports. Mobile esports, especially, will and should look different as well. I mean, you'll have the competitive bit, which which we stand for, you know, like the kind of hardcore, you know, let's you know do these big tournaments and all yeah. that. But then you'll also have different kinds of kinds of things happening. Uh, I'm excited for that. And I'll wait on that. Just I would agree completely, coming from an opposite angle. One of the things I was just looking at the other day because I was curious about it is there's something like 10 million views of Candy Crush videos on YouTube. Right? I mean, the most casual your mom plays a game out there. And people are actually watching people play streaming, and it's not just how to beat it. Yeah. So I, I mean, we're, we're pursuing it from there. We want all people to play and stay. People want all people to trade at it, but we fundamentally agree it's a huge market. So I, so we were, you just, sorry. Okay, and then just added to that too, I, I, during the presentation, I talked a little bit about China and um, a bunch of games out there that consider themselves mobile esports. So I mean, one like, kind of extreme but fun example is these dancing rhythm games. Because it does take skill, uh, there is that synchronous competition aspect to it, uh, and you know, people actually like watching it. You know, the, the, the way, and this is, it goes back to the arcade days. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember the Dance Dance Revolution. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. That's competition too. Yeah, seeing somebody be actually good at it in the arcade, realizing that yeah, you, you could actually you just kind of watch that, yeah, and then you yeah. walk away before you exit. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's certainly why I did. Um, but no, okay, that's, that's really interesting. So, so we're looking at the market. So, it's inside the market, we're looking at maybe even more breadth than there is in the PC market. Um, so a question which is, you know, if you're a developer, you're a publisher, can you make, can you go out to make an esports game? And, and, and if so, what does it take? You know, or, or is, or do you have to just make a multiplayer game and see, you know, is, is it something, you know, because it, it feels to me like things coalesce around something, but it, you didn't necessarily set out, maybe you did, but I don't know. You, you, can you make it? Can you just go out and go, I'm making esports? So, uh, in, in my opinion, no, you can't. You, you have to focus on building a great game and then trusting your community to 
maybe want to play it competitively. Um, and, and that's really kind of what happened to us. I and mean, we were like, all right, let's, let's make this mobile. And then you know what? It would be really awesome if people one day wanted to play it competitively, but that's like 10 years from now. And then all of a sudden we're like, we were in like alpha, beta, something only in Singapore, and we had the first competitions running, right? You said um, you've encouraged it, you've taken it on. Yeah, you're, yeah, you're and then it was like, oh, shoot, we're really not ready for this, but people want this, then okay, fine, let's make it happen. Yeah. And that's how we ended up building the spectator client really quickly, and then um, kind of growing it from there. And I, I do think that it, it really comes down to building great games. You need to make really good games that, like you said, are, um, are, are fair, are not pay to win. They, they have to be based on skill, they have to be based on strategy. Um, to keep it interesting to watch, right? Yeah. Um, and then pretty much it's up to the community if they want to compete with them or not. But I guess what is the tipping point? And you've kind of made, uh, I will spread this out, but just, just uh, you, you said you made a game, it was very, it was very mobile, it was like, it be mobile, mobile, it's like, you know, it's a great hardcore game. And then, and then yeah, at some point there was a tipping point, we thought, yeah, let's, let's get behind this, let's throw this in, we are, we are, we've got what it takes to be this eSport thing. Was it, you said there's somebody else at a competition that, that was the catalyst? Or? Yeah, it was um, a German guy called Tomic, who is the founder of Vainglory League, um, which is still our biggest community-run um, organization. And he really wanted to do competitive Vainglory stuff playing from Germany on a server in Singapore. Um, and, and that's really where it's, it started from. So what they did, because it's a 3v3 game, so they decided that two people play, and then the third people, their third players are only spectating. <laughs> so that's yeah. how they were actually running the competition. At that point, it was like way too early. We're like, great, keep going. Um, and then a little bit later, when we actually had launched the game <laughs> to iOS, we were able to start actually thinking about supporting it in better. Right. Um, and then, that's, yeah, that's, 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 that was that's perfect. Acting. <laughs> so, what do, you, what do you think? I mean, like, do you think it's it's possible to to set up a set up a game to be more likely to succeed as a, as a sport? So we're talking about being fair. We talked about uh, being obviously a good game and a more player game. Is there anything else you think that would helps? Yeah, I'll just add to that. Um, you know, that was a really good example that you brought up, and that actually you know really stresses the uh, importance of community and the engagement with the actual players. Um, you know, we talked about streaming, we talked about you know, running events and tournaments, and a lot of it has to be driven by the people that play the game because they see it as a competitive product and they see it as something that they want to spend you know, hours upon hours of the day to, you know, not just to play, but almost to master. So, um, the, you know, alluding to what you were saying about um, you know, having that, the Vainglory tournament, um, the, what I'm seeing with some of the games, uh, so recently I've talked to um, uh, Critical Ops, so you know, they're a yeah, yeah, shooter, yeah. so they're in that alpha stage and already they're starting to build up a community because there's that fan base that likes to play first person shooters uh, on mobile. So I think as a developer you can only do so much to build a game but you know, keeping in mind that when, once this game goes live, are people going to be so engaged uh, with it that they want to produce their own content on Twitch, they want to record the gameplay and they want to keep playing competitively so that maybe one day they can win a prize. So um, what I'm seeing uh, in Asia sometimes is too forced. So, uh, you know, a lot of companies... So a lot of, a lot of Chinese games, like, now, a high percentage you know, of Chinese games consider themselves to be kind of useful. Right, right. And I think that's just throwing cash prizes to get people to play. And, and I think it's yeah. the wrong motivation you know, to uh, get people to try to play a game because there is a cash prize in the tournament. So I think it, it needs to be beyond that, and uh, the engagement in the community is, is, is a lot... Uh, yeah, I mean, communities come up about, like, 70 times. So I, I, guess, I guess in this whole process, your, your internal structure, community manager, or a community team is pretty damn important in the whole thing because it, it, it's nurturing those guys that you know. I know that for the Super Cell, even before they're looking at school stuff like the community management roles, really central to the whole team. Is that yeah. the same for, for you? Yeah, same for us. Like um, our biggest team internally, I think, is actually the community management team. So we have oh goodness, probably twenty community managers, so one per um, okay. many countries. Um, that stay very closely to the community, help support community level initiatives, because actually one, one part about our esports, yes we have our official seasonal structure that we run together with Twitch, but we also support community run organizations, yeah, tournaments, yeah exactly, it's like, hey we want to have a feed league, no, 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 like we, there was just a group of friends in Thailand who wanted to organize a competitive thing, we're like, here, great, have some in-game currency, we'll send you some stickers, please send us some photos, you know, like also supporting that is, is very important. Yeah. The community is feel it and kind of also to add into your point, I do feel like gamers are very allergic somehow to see what's kind of genuine and what's trying to be forced on them. And yeah. I do feel like if, if as a developer you're like, I'm going to build an eSport, I'm pretty sure it's going to backfire. I don't, I think people, like gamers just sense that and they're like, no, that, that doesn't feel right, that doesn't feel real. And there's something about just kind of 
making genuinely good games. So it's a good game, it's, it's obviously multiplayer, it's got to be fair and not pay to win, which is kind of, often that's different, that, that's the struggle because if you're making a game to make money, then uh, the pay to win tactics, certainly in Asia especially, is, is a big part of it. But and then community is the next thing. Can I challenge uh, some of this? You can challenge that. You've been sitting there quite yet. Yeah. Oh, no, no, it's no worries. Um, I'm not to give Heidi a hard time, but there's no way that you guys didn't make Vainglory what esports are like. I know, I've heard some of your <laughs> investors yeah, speak about you're that. You're entitled to your opinion, <laughs> but I will also say that is not the case. Okay. Um, maybe so. I think it, it to some degree depends on the audience of this. Um, I think it is an absolute red ocean right now to do the standard stuff. And especially, you know, it sort of depends who sort of the audience of this talk is. If I'm a developer, yeah. great if you have something that takes off. I mean, fair competition, I mean, all that stuff matters. You really should listen to the players, right? But I think it's important to not go at this in the absolutely linear way that everybody else does. I mean, Rocket League to me is a great example of a game that I would not think anybody would have predicted that, that would have become a non-trivial esport game. Yeah. Right? Here's a game where it's cars playing top. It's amazing. Right. And it's awesome. But they have released it for like three times before, or at least twice before. Right, so this is the interesting point. And I use that as the only really significant of the, I don't know, top eight or ten, I don't know the exact numbers of the sort of the yeah. most popular esports. But here is the game that's the outlier, right? And if I'm a smaller developer, and I'm not exceptionally well funded, I do not try and say, I'm going to beat Bangor, I'm going to beat CSK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? I mean, good for you, you might be the one that wins. Um, but even like, I mean, Clash Royale has been was fascinating because they took their different take on it. Yeah. And you know, our position is we don't care what kind of game wins. We just want people to use us as sort of a platform play. Yeah. But my suggestion is, I think it's a broader motivation. Is it fun to play somebody else with high stakes? Yeah. If you can say that about your game, not, whether money, whether leaderboard, whether stickers, it doesn't matter. Yeah. It is, if your game is more fun when you're competing and the competition is serious, and there's some element of strategy, which there is because it's a game, that is something that then you have an element of an esport, and then all this fair competition is critical. I mean, we're running on Twitch, and um, we didn't talk about it in this, but we have a number of the top 200 streamers. People are watching bowling tournaments, and they're participating actively, and people are rerunning them. I won't mention the streamers' names, just uh, go look it up. But people are doing this for a bowling game. That's clearly, to me, sort of, as they're watching, uh, one of the guys is um, uh, Super, Koopa Trooper, who does uh, Prominent One and Clash of Clans. Obviously, they're about to learn about Clash of Clans, but they're doing our bowling thing. And my point on that is, for a variety of games, and you know, we have a variety of different games, people have that same motivation. As long as it's sure. fair, and as long as you can tell a narrative about it, because I really think that's the key element, that there is a narrative, whether by person, by player, or whatever, then I would think more broadly. Yeah. I mean, I think there's no account for people to watch. Some people right. pay to watch England play football, for instance. <laughs> Never understood that. Um, but, so just, I was going to come back to you anyway, because I, I think we, we but there's, there's different types of kind of esport. Like, there's esport that's set up with a big tournament and a multiplayer thing. And, and, and skill gaming is, 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 is in that esport space, but it's quite a different experience right. to some degree. I mean, it, it's much more about playing competitively with you know, existing games. It could be not every game, but a lot of games with your kind of friends for some sort of prize. Right. So, I mean, the skill gaming part of it is the idea that. Um, it's, what it's forced us to do, from my perspective, is be really strict about fair competition. Because skill gaming, which we offer in a number of places, is you would play somebody else in a particular game in perfectly even circumstances with the exact same setup, and you both basically put in a tournament entry and somebody wins some money, Deb gets some, we get some. Yeah. That's not the majority of our play, and I'll be blunt that that, while I think a meaningful part of our business, is to me the beginning part of our business. Yeah. What's good about that is because we have to deal with skill gaming, because we have to deal with real money, we have to be really tight about fraud, we have to be really tight about fairness. And that, I really think, is the more important component to it, because it's, you know, if you play poker with your friends, if you don't play for money, people don't play poker right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and that's the fundamental it's problem. It's online poker, you know, no And it's not fun, like, Clash Royale, as good a game as it is, is very annoying when you have somebody who is, has the same number of trophies and higher level units than you. Yeah, yeah. Right? And that is one of the minor dings of that game to me that limits it because, I mean, it's satisfying if you have level 9 units to beat the level 11 units, yeah. but it's still cheating it a little. And from my perspective, I really don't care if they play for money, I don't care if they play for virtual currency. I want them in fair tournaments where they can trust. I want us to sort of be the referees. Yeah. And I think for people making games, can you play your game fairly? Could you sit with your friends around a table, you know, put money, put bragging rights, put something you care about, put the trophy of uh, if anybody's ever seen the league, uh, whatever that girl they went to high school with is, and have somebody care about that because that is the core player motivation. And that motivation, I think people as gamers tend to blow off the sports part of these sports because yeah. we're all, you know, not, we're all great at sports. 
Um, Speak for yourself. Yeah. Okay. Great. <laughs> English, uh, but you know, like we're like, yeah, sports, whatever. But there is a profound element of that. And what's fun about sports is you want to be at a. What you care about when you play pickup basketball is that you find a good team where it's evenly matched. Yeah. That is the core element, and even if you're, I mean, it's great if you're good. I mean, lots and lots of kids aspire to be on the teams, to be a lead in one of the games. But simply getting out and playing basketball is fun. Yeah, yeah. If you can find a good match. Yeah. Right? And that's, I mean, that's certainly our angle on it. But it's fun to level, yeah. I, I get the point. It's, it's being able to match. compete at a level where, yeah, you're not going to be playing against the big boy guys in the tournament. And there's a lot of old guys at the gym playing basketball or playing soccer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's still fun. You still like it. You yeah, still yeah. are involved in it. It's still the great, massive no, I think, majority. Yeah, I agree. I think that's the way it opens up is when that, that yeah. tournament competition can come down to everybody. And everybody I mean, do you have any gear from like, your favorite pro football player at this point? Favorite, favorite, favorite. <laughs> <laughs> oh, soccer, sorry. So, no, no, I, I, yeah, yeah. No, you do, right? And then you can't help it. And yeah. Because you still get to play a little bit. Yeah, yeah, right. Exactly. Actually, yeah, on that, actually, I actually have a comment question, despite the fact that I'm a panelist, but I want to do a little bit of moderation as well. Because I, I think it brings up an interesting topic that I, I've been thinking a lot about as well. Is that with esports, with, uh, you know, we talk about a number of products that are out there, and especially, let's say, a uh, lot uh, number of games that have integrated with skills. Um, you know, as a player, um, if I really want to be good at a game consistently, win, I have to pick the game that people play as well. So, um, you know, it's the same thing with the Olympics, right? If I aspire to be an Olympic athlete, which sport do I want to dedicate my time to so that I can become a professional and try to go for gold? So, I mean, what's your take on that? I mean, as a pl player, let's say, um, it, it's risky for me to commit all my resources to try to be good at something when there are so many games out there. But, and knowing that there's a risk that half a year down the line, this game might not be around anymore. So. I don't know how you would address that. So, I guess from my perspective, it's great that somebody wants to be a pro gamer. That's less interesting to me, I would say, if you like that, be good at a lot of games, pick the one you get traction on and go. Um, I just want everybody to play something where they're playing it fair. I don't care, I really don't care what game it is. I suspect that what yeah. you see is, people have a long-term allegiance to a game, I bet that they don't carry more than two games that they're serious about for esports. Yeah. Because the cognitive load is significant to understand a game at a profound level. What I hope is, they have that one they love and they aspire to be professional in, and there are a couple others that they're trying that are fun, that are part of their lives, and that really, and this is speaking as an old school gamer, I just want to have a multiplayer that doesn't suck at all. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's really the thing. And that's I can't understand that. I mean, multiplayer is, it's, 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 you know, it's, it's, broken. it's broken in freedom. Well, okay. But, but yeah. Unless, Unless you're talking about an eSport. That's why. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, no, I think mean, I get that. I get that. So um, we're, 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 we're intimate for the group of the legislature. So does anybody have a question? I've got a couple more things to ask. Anybody got a question? We've got a man with a question here. Go on. Okay. Right. Yeah. Uh, Microphone's coming. Microphone's coming. Run, Forrest. Sorry. I always want to say that. <laughs> that's good. I'm good. That's, I mean, I'm going to have to pay for that later, I think. Not so much. Oh, is it on? Yeah. yeah. yeah okay. uh, not so much a question, but actually, uh, just on what Ed was saying, I'm actually a former pro gamer for Warcraft 3. And, uh, Basically what happened is the game dropped in popularity like completely off, nobody was really playing it anymore, and it's kind of shitty, it was like, okay, so you're really good at this game and nobody's playing it anymore, what do you do now? And you kind of have to move on to something else, so. Uh, there is that risk, like you were saying right there, just, when you were talking about it, I just had to say something, that's all. Um, yeah, 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 so how, how, um, uh, what, how long did you play it, and how kind of good did you get at it? I, I, well, uh, I was uh, number one in North America for... That sounds good. ...about a year, yeah. Wow. So, yeah. What do you play now? Uh, right now, uh, I play like League of Legends at like flat level, so uh, nothing really. Yeah. Uh, I played Magic Online. Uh, it was top six before in the world, like I don't know, a year or two ago. Not so much anymore. But so your your frustration is that you've dedicated your time to this. It's like someone going, oh, "I'm professional football. We stop playing football now." It's, it's that kind of. Yeah, it's like. If you're, if you're going to be a pro athlete in football, and it's like, well, you know football's going to be around, but it's still going to be there in 10 years. Yeah, yeah. So it's really awful to be like, oh, well, you're really good at a game, and then in five years, that game's not, nobody plays it anymore. So. No, it's a very good point. It's a very good point. Yeah, uh, obviously, yeah. Uh, there's, there's kind of bellwethers, there's the kind of strikes people still playing has been around for a hell of a long time. Yeah, when, I, when I was young, when I was young, I think good games. That was uh, that was uh, Counter Strike's thing, but um, but yeah. yeah Counter Strike still played today as well. I mean, CS:GO is very popular. So okay. Uh, so Any I'm other pro games? Games don't. Unfortunately, if you get caught in the wrong ones. Cool. All right. Well, that's uh, interesting. Interesting stuff. Um, I've got I've got two kind of more questions before we kind of wrap it up and go go some more. So, one is, one is that we talked about earlier with the brand panel, and, and it's kind of a bit of a, the theme of this whole sort of track is, is, is about the international nature of the industry. Like, 
mobile more than any other games part of the games industry is truly, truly international. Um, so in terms of uh, the variance, I mean, esports in Asia is obviously, as a whole, far more advanced. And, and it, uh, what are the main differences? And how, how, you know, are you thinking of a game? You know, is Vancouver are you obviously doing the tournaments out there? But can you can you be an esport everywhere, or do you have to kind of focus in on the region? Um, yes, you can be an esport everywhere, but you also need to really focus on each of the regions and playing to to their strengths and strengths and differences. Yeah. Um, on Super Evil side, we're super focused on North America and Europe, and then we work with partners in Asia, so we have, we worked together with OGN on Game Network in Korea for the past year, so they've run um, competitive Bing Warrior there, it's been broadcast on TV, and it's, it's pretty impressive stuff. Yeah. Um, so, so they really know how to address that market, and I think Korea especially is kind of the prime example of, of esports overall. It's just been around there so, so much longer than anywhere else, and it's very established. Um, and then uh, we're also working um, together with Giant in China, they're our, our publisher, so we're kind of um, working on the esports side of things together with partners over there. So honestly, like I'm not the best person to kind of address the difference. No, no, no. Yeah. Um, but I think mobile esports, especially, is so young everywhere um, that kind of the very same kind of questions, problems, opportunities, and threats kind of occur uh, globally. Um, and I do think that especially kind of our community is very passionate to see these kind of region versus region competition or world competition to kind of really compare which region is actually better. Yeah. Um, and I do, th do think that mobile especially because the games are inherently so global and in the hands of people across the world, I think there's a lot of interest from gamers to see see each other from around the world. Yeah. And that's what well, we did with Samsung at E3. We had um, a European team, US team, it was German, Germany, US, China, and Korea. Um, play, play in an invitational, that was super fun, and the okay. players were, and the audience was ecstatic about it, so. Cool. Yeah. Do you have any concerns? I know you had some data showing <laughs> so. yeah, I won't read that, but I'll go back and read that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I talked a little bit about China, so I, I think you know, one of the, the breakout opportunities uh, in China is just the fact that, you know, they were uh, late adopters in, in terms of gaming, right? They never had console gaming, so. Um, you know, the way that um, you know, every household had a you know, uh, PlayStation, you know, they never went for that experience. And you know, they don't have the space. Let's say you know, I lived in Hong Kong for uh, a little while, and this is not a you know, space for a PC game room, right? So mobile is big because it's uh, so much more accessible and everyone has a smartphone there. So I mean, that's why the companies in China you know, were so aggressive in trying to push out mobile esports. Uh, and that's why I mentioned that um, you know, according to stupid data, 24% uh, of top 100 grossing uh, games are considered mobile esports games there. So, but they're considered by the, the, the publishers or considered by the public? Um, that's like high perceived data. Yeah, right? yeah, but, um, but yeah, I, I think you know, that's what the one difference I've spotted. Just, you know, the makeup of the market, the way people uh, play the games. Um, and obviously, uh, with mobile esports, um, the more mobile devices and the more mobile gamers there are, the, the big potential it has. Okay, cool. And five five percent. I get a lot. Of, one question on prediction. I guess. Tencent have recently acquired a small Finnish company, um, uh, and they are already have you know they already uh, own a relatively large esports business already. I mean, do you think there's going to be any? Do you think that'll shake up mobile esports a, a little bit? I mean, I'm, I'm not saying Volker's going to let them come in and change what they're doing, but clearly, you know, they've got they've got sort of League of Legends and 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 Supercell's you know Clash Royale's going that way. Do you think that's going to be accelerate that kind of growth of, of that game and, and the other games? Will it affect the market? One of these two. Well, um, you know, just having worked in China, I mean, uh, I've worked a little bit with Tencent, and uh, you know, a lot of people talk about the, the synergies between the companies they own. But the interesting thing with Tencent is that um, you know, there was an investment panel yesterday too, and they talked about how hands off this deal is. So yeah. um, you know, Supercell still has full independence, uh, and they can they still pay finish tax and uh, everything else. And that's the same way Tencent has approached all the companies that they've. Um, put stakes in um, because you know people talk about that they, they own Riot, they own Supercell, but they also own a piece of Glue, Mini Clip, uh, Pocket Gems, so on and so forth, right? So, you know, there's a lot of synergy within these companies, but I, I think they purposely uh, structured That's not what it. I thought, yeah, yeah. And so so I think you know, there will be conversations, but I wouldn't expect it to be like here, Riot, talk to Supercell, make something happen. I, I don't think that's gonna happen. Yeah, I, I fully agree on that. I, I know Supercell folks, <laughs> quite Absolutely a few of them, <laughs> and and for them, it's it's always about um, independence and also always about long-term vision. And I do think that Tencent offers them um, 
different kind of reach and potential in China that they haven't had before. And, I, and I'm kind of curious to see um, what comes out of out of it in, in the coming year. And kind of whatever Supercell will do in, in the esports space, I'm pretty sure it's going to be awesome. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we'll look forward to that. Yeah, yeah. Supercell's no, already done. It. I think the lead, the sort of the story varies the lead, which is Clash Royale is esports. Yeah. It is esports for a much broader audience. Yeah. And it is going. It is transforming. I guarantee you, there are ten percent of all the games being out there are deconstructing the hell out of that game, trying to figure yeah, out how yeah, to do yeah. it. Yeah, that's really bad. Yeah. So final thing, is there any one piece of advice, a small thing video will be out there, one piece of advice for the guys wanting to get into this space and got a mobile game and be successful, is there any one piece, overriding piece of advice if you want to try and compete as a developer publisher in the mobile games, esports space? Um, from my point, um, honestly listen to the community, um, kind of what you were saying that Vainglory uh, wouldn't have been built without esports in their mind, if I'm saying it correctly. Um, I mean, there's a point to that. I mean, yes, we built Vainglory to be a great game, but then when the community started wanting to play competitively, we listened to that and responded. Yes. So, so in that sense, I do agree. Um, and obviously, adding in features and adding in content that does make it more um, esports appropriate is very good. But also, I wouldn't forget about the, the less competitive players. Um, it, I think uh, there's a certain part of the player base that will be competitively minded and really want to go for that, but we also have a broad base we just want to enjoy a great game, so don't neglect those people either. That's fair. That's fair. <laughs> yeah. Take a bill. I would say keep it simple, keep it polished, keep it fair. Okay? I would not be adding a lot of features. I would keep it, I would resist the temptation to add a million units. It's much more fun. I mean, I think the reason StarCraft was so popular for so long is they were obsessive about tuning that game. They were by far the first live service in any meaningful sense. They just kept, just kept going in, they watched the heck out of how people played. It kept finding breakers, kept changing, it, kept fixing it. If you have your game and you have some traction, just get it right at the absolute core because you will get an audience. If people like it, if they retain, retention is king, and I think for esports, fairness is critical. Cool. And yeah, no, no final words. Uh, I think you have to think outside the box. Uh, a lot of people, they try to em you know, emulate what's um, happened in PC on console and do a mobile game. So you know, uh, it's easier to brand Green Glory as the you know, uh, mobile League of Legends. You know, there's mobile FPS. I think a lot of people are thinking that, but uh, you know, we talk about uh, Clash Royale. Uh, people still struggle to categorize what kind of game it is. You know, is, yeah. is it a well, competitive? Yeah. yeah, but you know, we do agree that you know, it's competitive and it has potential to be an esports game. So I think, you know, as a developer or publisher, you have to think outside of the box. So if you're building a competitive game, I'm not just trying to replicate the PC experience and put it on mobile. You have to be creative and think about what you can do with this mobile device to make a game that's fun, competitive, balanced, and all the things that we talked about. Brilliant. Okay, thank you very much. Well, I think it's time for lunch now. So, a big round of applause, please. Thank you very much. We are now going to walk off for lunch. We'll be back.